Welcome to this special edition of Metro Focus. I'm Jack Ford. Her murder in 1964 shocked the collective conscience of New York City and eventually the world. But what do we really know about what happened to Kitty Genovese? We know that the 28-year-old bar manager was on her way home from work when she was attacked repeatedly in her Queens neighborhood. Her killer confessed to the stabbing, which took on a life of its own after the New York Times published this story, reporting that dozens of Genovese's neighbors watched for more than half an hour as the crime unfolded. While many of the facts behind that original report turned out not to be true, the image of New Yorkers standing by as a young woman was killed has become a part of the fabric of New York City's history. The case has also motivated Kitty's brother, William Genovese, to find out just what really happened to his sister during those early morning hours. His search for answers is now the subject of a documentary called The Witness. It makes its theatrical debut this week. Let's take a quick look. Exactly what was it you heard? Save me, save me. Didn't this frighten you or shock you? No. I was 16 when my sister Kitty was murdered in New York City. For years, I avoided the details of that night. But it's worse not knowing the truth. Time's story was seen as proof that New York City was uncaring, and my sister's been the symbol of bystander apathy for decades. No one investigated the 38, no one followed up on it or anything of that nature. Was it worth all the attention it got, or was it a media creation? It's a fascinating story. And undoubtedly so, newspapers. I heard somebody saying, help, help. I called the police. You called the police? Always. The story doesn't make any sense to me. I'm sick of listening to people tell you 38 people stood by and watched. That's not so. It really doesn't take a lot to kill a person, I guess. Maybe we could start it off by talking about what it is you're trying to accomplish by having a meeting with Winston Mosley. The choices that he made in his life were all related to the fact that no one helped his sister. And if he knows the truth, that's a peacefulness. At what point are you going to be satisfied? 50 years later, we're still talking about Kitty. I can't stop until I feel like it's over. Yeah, like, when is I'll it know, over? I'll, I'll know when it's over. Joining me now with more on the documentary and the Kitty Genovese case is her brother, Bill Genovese, and the film's director, James Solomon. Gentlemen, welcome to you. I, I've, I've watched the film. It, it, it's revealing, it's powerful, it's haunting in a lot of ways. So, Bill, the first question is for you. More than 50 years have gone by since your sister's death. Obviously, painful mm -hmm. years in so many ways. Why did you decide you wanted to embark on this journey and, and, and go back and, and, and try to find out whatever you could find out about this? Yeah, it was, it was actually 40, year, it was 40 years after that it started, because after Jim Rassenberger's article in The Times, which recasts the story, and threw a lot of doubt onto the original story of 38 eyewitnesses. Jim's, Jim Rassenberger's article was sort of a catalyst for me to like, wow, is it the 1964 story? Is it the 2004 story? What is the story? So then uh, Jim and I, who had met earlier, uh, we kind of both saw that as the catalyst to get into it. Jim, how about you? you you've had an illustrious career as a screenwriter. Um, and you've done some directing, but this is your directorial debut, where you're helming this whole thing. What was it that drew you to, to this part of the Kitty Genovese story? Oh, it's one word, Bill. Uh, this began for me as a screenplay for HBO, actually, based on the iconic 38 watch for a half hour. That project didn't come to fruition, but in the process of researching it, I met Bill. The minute you meet Bill, Kitty comes to life. Kitty, to all of us, is only known for the way she died the last 30 minutes of her life. And when you meet Bill, who is as close to anyone as Kitty, she begins to come alive. He also said to me at the time, I needed to prove that I was not only one of the people, would have been one of the people who would have opened the window that night, but would have gone down into the street. When you look back, 
um, Bill, you were about 16 at yes. the time that that, right. that Kitty was killed, and um, you listen and you watch the documentary, you get a sense that you, you were very close to her, even with the difference in ages, yeah. and you were living up in Connecticut at the time, she was here in New York City. When you look back at this, what was your first reaction to hearing about your sister's death? In terms of the 38 Witness article, my first reaction was, how could that be? How could all these people actually watch this over three attacks where the, where the perpetrator was leaving, coming back, leaving, coming back? How, how could it be? But then it, then it morphed into, well, the Times is saying it. I guess it's true. So what do I think about that? As you look back at it now, certainly you had the, the pain of the loss. Yes. But then as you describe it, you had another layer of pain sort of superimposed on that, as so many people felt. 38 people, nobody did anything to help. Right. Did, did that anger stay with you, that sense of how could nobody be willing to help her until you started to delve into the yeah. story deeper? It, um, yes. I mean, but it was interesting because it would go back and forth between I could not believe it to, oh my God, how could that be? And then I'd be, oh, it's the city, you know, because we were living in the suburbs then, in New Canaan, Connecticut. And it's, oh, the city, of course, it's the city, it's a whole different thing. And then, you know, I'd still go back and forth, but the thing that really burrowed into me the most was this notion that, well, maybe it wasn't 38, maybe people heard, but how can nobody pick up a phone and do anything? Jim, from your perspective, I'm going to talk about the media coverage here. You were a journalist to start with, became a writer, now right. a director. And this, this became the narrative. This was the Kitty Genovese story. Very people knew the, the personal details of her life and who she was. But anybody, it was a buzzword. You mentioned Kitty Genovese and people mm. think people apathy, public apathy, people ignoring somebody else who needs help. And it was the story that the media ran with. It's interesting. I was watching the documentary about three minutes in. I'm there. Uh, from back in the 90s when I used to host the Today Show on the weekends and I'm starting to deliver a report. And you look exactly about, the same. Oh, <laughs> there was a lot less gray hair back then and there. But I started to deliver a report. It had to do with an appeal. But the lead is Kitty Genovese, dozens of people ignoring her cries mm. for help. How does a story like that become so alive and become the narrative? Well, there, there is this uh, uh, axiom in journalism. Some stories are too good to check. This seemed to be one of those. Uh, Mike Wallace, who appears in the film, uh, he comments it sold a lot of newspapers. What is astounding is it took Till Bill to unravel this story. It is fascinating to see how you find, you're drawing the line, they're no longer alive, no longer alive. Here's somebody who is, mm -hmm. let's go talk to her. I, I don't wanna give away the whole documentary. Right. It's a great film. But tell me some of the things that were most surprising to you that you did discover on this journey. The major one was that somebody was with Kitty as she was expiring at the end of her life, there to hold her and comfort her. Nobody in my family, including myself, ever knew that. We should have. If we looked over the trial transcript way back when, we would have seen that that was the case. But you didn't want to, the family didn't want to be at the trial for understandable reasons, no. just because of the pain yeah. involved. My mother was, my mother a year later had a stroke. I mean, she was so devastated and she was only 53 when she had the strokes, so she was 52 then. So yeah, I mean, it was a lot of our mission as a family was to protect my mother from news, either newspaper clippings that were sent from her friends or what was on the news because I'd come home from school and she'd have a clipping in front of her, tears running. I mean, it was terrible. It was just awful. I think that's what is, in some respects, unconscionable, <laughs> that for five decades, uh, this woman, Sophia Farrar, who runs out in the middle of the night down a dark alley, pushes her way inside a vestibule where she has no idea who's inside, and cradles Kitty, as Bill said, how that gets left out of the story. Man, is, that's courageous. To, in the middle help, of the night but, for yeah. a woman but, to run out not knowing what she was running into and then and as you said and hold her. But there you know it, it sort of if the story is the story was 38 watched and no one did anything. If you'd say well some people watched and some people heard but and there was this woman who ran down stairs we would not be talking about Kitty Genovese 50 years later. We would not know her name and I think one of the um, 
there's some good that came of it. The 911 emergency system was propelled in part by this uh, Good Samaritan laws. But in many respects, I mean, the worst, the most tragic thing is that Kitty is only known for the way she died. And yet that also happened within the family. It was so difficult. So that was, the, your, that was your memory. It turns out it was false. Right. But that's what all you had to hold on to. It turned out not to be true at all, that there was somebody, as you said, holding her in her last moment. But also her life. She was a 28-year-old living, uh, running a bar, uh, driving a red Fiat. She had a, she was this very uh, compelling, she's a millennial living in 1964. Yeah. And we say this often when we talk to documentary filmmakers, it is a journey, and you're taking the viewers on a journey. Here, you're chronicling his journey, Bill's journey throughout. Mm. So I guess my question to you is, you learned a great deal, we know that, but was the journey worth it for you? Oh, definitely so, because I felt I owed it to my parents, I owed it to Kitty, to the rest of my family, and to myself, to once I saw the 38, you know, 38 witnesses, that's 1964, 2004, uh, we're recasting it, no, that wasn't really, well, all right, then what was the story? So it was, my sister always answered my questions. We were 12 years apart, but yet, she was unlike most adults, she gave me voice. To me, this is the ultimate love story. A brother determined, beyond determined, to reclaim his sister's life from her death. I've never experienced, I, I, as a screenwriter, I'll never have, I, this is life. And um, mm -hmm. what Bill does in the course of these 10 years in reclaiming Kitty's life from her death is stunning. And, and you talk about her answering your questions, and, and, and in a very strange way, decades later, she helped you to, to answer yeah, those questions. Yeah, and then there was the added impetus of you were alone then, I'll continue to be with you now and try to find out what it was like for you to be alone in that situation. Well, it, it, it was a compelling journey, mm -hmm. journey that you undertook and that you chronicled. It's a, it's a fabulous documentary. Jim, Bill, thanks so much for spending some time Thank you. with us. Yeah, thanks so much. For and a reminder to you folks, The Witness opens in theaters this Friday at the IFC Film Center in New York City. For more information on the documentary, head over to our website, metrofocus.org.